Good evening. It's 8:45 p.m. on Monday, the 18th of December, 2017. It's the last one before Christmas. It's the Cat's Whiskers, and we're live. The Cat's Whiskers podcast is proudly sponsored by the Bunkers Hill Hockley. Don't miss Panthers game day offers, including Coors Light at two pounds fifty a pint. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Cat's Whiskers podcast. My name is John A. Bullard. It's going to be a difficult one this week. I have another two defeats for the Nottingham Panthers. One point coming from the game on Saturday. Joining me to discuss all that, plus the player of the week, all the other elite league news, etc., etc., are Tina Taylor. Hiya. And Adam Reddish. Good evening, everyone. Right, as I said, this is the last uh, one before Christmas and the New Year, because we'll be taking a break after this one. More on that a little later. But if you would like to get in contact with us, the best way to do so is via Twitter. It's at Cats Whiskers TV. And uh, if you send us a tweet during the show, we will do our very, very best uh, to feature it on the broadcast. However, we are going to start with Saturday. Panthers taking on the Manchester Storm. At the Storm Shelter, it was a 2-1 overtime defeat for the Panthers. Robert Farmer with Panthers goal on the power play. Storm goals from Dallas Erdar and Matt Becker getting the overtime winner. So, Tina, I'll come to you first. Was that a point gained or a point lost? Um, difficult, really, because with the scoreline being so low for both sides... It doesn't. It doesn't really feel like one or the other for me. I, you know, if, if if it could only only have been worse if it had been a nil nil game and gone to overtime. I think, but yeah, with with just one goal being scored by each side, as soon as you get into overtime, it's you know all bets are off. I mean, I know early on in the season we had a pretty good overtime and shoot out record. You know, we seem to be able to close those games out and just, you know, and, and snatch that extra point. Um, but, you know, recent form has, has obviously, you know, translated into us not being able to pick up that extra point. I mean, the one thing I will say is it's it's good for us to go away to another, another team's spawn and, and come away with something. Um, you know, it's... We, we we could we could be sitting here, you know, l- lamenting another zero point weekend. Um, th- there is there is a you know a small light there, so I, I suppose all all things considered, perhaps if it, it feels like a point one, uh, given given the form that we're in, given that we were away in you know a place that we we we, we do sometimes. We sometimes struggle in, I suppose, and you know the early form of of Manchester as well. Whilst that seems to have slipped away, they're still a very competitive team. Adam, what says you? Yeah, I think I agree with a lot of what Tina said there. Um, you know, any point that we can pick up at the moment, you know, given how poorly we're playing in the last two or three weekends, is is probably you know a good thing for us. Um, you know, I was confident going into that game that we were going to get two points so I suppose you know from where I was to where we are now in that we lost in overtime and we only picked a point up I am disappointed because I thought it was a winnable game but you know I suppose you have to look at it in the wider context and we're not in good form at the moment as I'm sure we'll talk about in the next hour or so Um, so you just have to pick up the points where you can and if you pick up a point and you don't play particularly well then you know most sides will take that um so so yeah i mean we don't know how important that point might be you know if if we manage to arrest this little mini slump that we're in um you know that point might be an important point at the end of the season who knows and it's a very it's a very difficult game to to talk about none of us were there due, due to other other things that we were doing and there's been no highlights out yet apart from the goals so we've we've only seen the goals but as we've already alluded to manchester are 
a good side. They've had a very, very good start to the season. It's We lost there, albeit in a dead rubber Challenge Cup game the last time we played in Altrincham. So maybe it is a point gain, even in this sort of slump of form that we're in. But we will move on to Sunday, and I think there'll be a lot more discussion around this one. So... Sunday, Panthers taking on conference rivals, the Belfast Giants, a team they have beaten in their three previous encounters this season. However, it was the Giants who finally got one back against the Panthers with a 6-2 victory. Panthers goal scored by Mark Delego and Tim Billingsley, both in the first period. Jim Van Der Meer, a Sebastian Silvestre hat-trick, Brendan Connolly and David Rutherford getting the Giants' goals. Um... Adam, we'll start with you. Was that the worst Panthers performance of the season so far? Um, certainly the, the worst one that I've seen live. Um, I know we uh, we put in two pretty lousy performances down in Cardiff earlier this season um, and we got soundly beaten both times. But uh, I think this one yesterday felt really poor for me. Um, you know, oddly enough, I don't think we played particularly bad in the first period. Um and you know, it seemed like there's a little bit more energy from the, the players and that we were looking a bit better offensively, uh, which has been a, a major problem for us of late. And, you know, it's just we keep shooting ourselves in the foot. I mean, we we got 2-1 up and, and then we let Belfast score with, what, six or seven seconds left in the period. And, you know, that, that just sends us into the interval, you know, having undone a lot of that good work. And you know, from then on, it was just an unmitigated disaster. Really, you know, the the roof fell in on the performance, and yeah, I mean, the less I said about the performance, the better. But we've got to talk about it. Um, it just everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Um, you know, we were defensively sloppy. I mean, how much time uh, for the second goal for Giants last night? I don't think there's another Panthers player remotely close. And we just, we keep shooting ourselves in the foot, leaving ourselves open at the back. Um, you know, if, if we're not scoring many goals, and you've got to keep it tight defensively and, you know, try and get points like we did the previous night in Manchester, you know, getting the overtime point. But we weren't very tight at all yesterday. And, you know, Garnet saw a lot of shots, a lot of rubber. And in the end, we we're, were really thankful for, for what he did because... You know, it could have been a hell of a lot worse in terms of the scoreline, but it's quite clear to see that guys are playing with with low confidence at the moment. You know, they're trying things that might have worked earlier on in the season, and it's not coming off for them. Maybe it's because teams have sussed us out a little bit now. You know, because um, we've probably played every side, and you know, coaches know what our players are about. Uh, they probably feel a bit more confident that they've got you know, systems in place to try and shut down some of the more offensive players that we've got. And, you know, it's it's all adding up to a really, really you know, difficult period for us at the moment. And um, quite frankly, it's, it's difficult to see how we're going to sort of fight our way out of it. But, um, you know, we've got to do that because if we want to stay in touch with, with Belfast and Cardiff at the top of the table, then, you know, we've got to get out of this slump soon. But I, I don't know what we need to do to try and, you know, go in the right direction again and, and start to, you know, play with more confidence and, you know, just have that sort of feel good factor amongst what we were doing. Because, you know, a few weeks ago, things were great. You know, players were playing well. Uh, we were playing some great hockey and, you know, everything's just gone absolute full circle. And and it's I'm struggling to try and put my finger on what exactly has changed because, you know, it's it's difficult to go from playing so well to playing so poorly. I mean, generally, you, you fall out of form over a, a period of time, but this has almost been an overnight thing. And and I'm I'm really confused about why we're, you know, struggling to do some of the basics anymore. Yeah, I've got to I've got to agree with that. I mean, I've been away working, so the last game I saw was the four-one victory over the Steelers. And the difference between that match and this it was night and day. And I I just couldn't believe what I was watching at times. It was it was slow, it was lethargic, uh, defence was non-existent. I mean, Tina, where, where was the defence? Because it seemed at times that the Giants were just given the complete freedom of their offensive zone. Yeah, it was... Uh... 
it was a little bit disheartening <laughs> to, to say the least um yeah we should post a reward <laughs> for, for anybody who finds the defense because um uh, there, there were some definite switch off moments uh, what i mean you know one thing belfast seemed to be quite adept at doing yesterday was uh you know the the, the one guy finding his way you know in front of the net with absolutely nobody picking him up and you know that those kind of plays were what were responsible for for, for most of the Giants' goals. I think uh, you know the, the one at the end of the first period aside, where I think the general assumption was that um, that put was going to exit the zone and that was going to be the end of the period and we were going to go into the first break two uh, one and, and we didn't. You know, there is enough time to score a goal. <laughs> yeah, you know, as, as as Belfast fans probably, you know, any of them that remember a few years back where. I think we'd coasted to a fairly comfortable win in the first leg of a Challenge Cup tie, and um, David Clark scored another scored a goal with three seconds left on the clock. So you know, seven seconds left on on the clock there. That that was plenty of time to to get another one if they really wanted to. You know, it's the you know, it, it can be done. You know, the, this game happens at such a such a pace. You cannot afford to switch off. You know, I, I, another classic example of, of where we've done a similar thing. You know, we we allowed the Steelers to get a last minute win, winner in uh, the Challenge Cup game up there uh, when Sam Gospel was in goal. You know, fifty nine, fifty nine, <laughs> and that blooming thing goes in as well. So, yeah, the, the, there was a bit of switching off. Uh, Belfast forwards were, you know, the, there was one of them finding themselves, you know, in in acres of space to be able to. Uh, shoot pucks on on Garnet and yeah he he had uh, he, he, it's a blooming good job that that Garnet switched on because otherwise those six goals could we could have been talking about a lot more yeah um just moving on i mean michael garnet had a stellar performance in net and one of the few positives from the game I mean, how grateful are we to to him for saving us from a complete embarrassment? Because he made <laughs> three or four absolutely world class saves. You know, where he just threw himself in front of the puck and, and stopped almost certain yeah. goals. Yeah. Mm. He saved us from a complete embarrassment. He did, and any other any other game, you know, I mean, to, if if he'd have done that, you know, a month ago when we were in form and we were. You know, we were scoring wonderful goals and, you know, bringing points home pretty regularly. And we weren't in a, um, you know, a four, a four game loss slump. You know, I, I, you know, I know one was an overtime loss. You know, let's not be pedantic. It was still a loss. Um, you know, but if, if he does that in a game a month ago, then, uh, you know, we're, we're a lot more excited about it. Now we're grateful for it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, some of the saves yesterday were... It took the breath away. They were that good, and they were quite unconventional as well. <laughs> yeah, you don't generally see uh, netminders taking off football style. Um, you know, to try and dive across and you know, knock the puck out of the air. So, you know, some of the saves were quite unconventional, but they were great to watch. Uh, it was a shame that he had to make them, and he was so busy. But, uh, but you're right. I mean, he did spare us from being on the end of a very ugly scoreline. And um, you know, I th- we just need to be giving whoever's between the pipes, more protection because you know, we've never been a free-scoring team this season. You know, we, I mean, the league table shows that in the goals for column. You know, if you look at the, the difference now, I think we're only plus seven between the goals scored and the goals conceded. That is correct, and, yeah. And, you know, I think that the game, that certainly the, the approach that Corey's taken this year is, you know, we've been defensively sound for 90% of the time. But when you're not scoring goals, you've got to keep it tight at the back. And, you know, yesterday we were so wide open, it was untrue. And, you know, as you said a minute or two ago, Jono, some of the Belfast forwards were probably embarrassed at the amount of time and space that they had in our defensive zone. It seemed like there was nobody remotely close to them and they were just able to get shots in the you know, will against Garnet. And that's got to really be alarming because I've, I've not seen our defence be as porous as that for a long time. And we, we've we've got to just look at all aspects of, of our play, you know, from front to back. I, I don't think there's an issue with net minding, um, but, you know, until yesterday or maybe last week, I would have said there's no problems with the defence either. But, you know, there's been some some very you know, disheartening performances from, from guys on the blue line in the last few weeks. 
um, added to the problem that we're just not scoring nearly enough goals at the other end of the ice. So, you know, it's taking the net mining situation out of the equation. It seems like a bit of a perfect storm at the moment. As bad as we were, though, the Giants were very good. And I suppose we have to play them a lot of credit. They were clinical in front of the net and, and took their chances. Can you, you see them challenging for the league? Because it's been said a lot. They've got 22 out of their last 30 games, I think, at home. And that's a huge advantage. And considering they're in joint first place with 35 points, having played most of the season away from home, they're certainly a team to watch. Mm. Well, I, I, I suppose any of us in in the Earhart Conference would would expect to be there or thereabouts. But at the moment, there's you know Belfast and Cardiff are, are definitely proving it that because you know look, look where they are in the table and you know we we, we are. You know, doing our usual, we've started well <laughs> and uh, Christmas has uh, apparently arrived. And I mean, the only the, the only curveball in all that is that the, the Steelers seem to be having a bad time of it as well. So, you know, at least uh, even, even if it is them, then, you know, we've still got somebody to cosy up to and feel, you know, like we're licking our wounds a little bit at the moment. <laughs> I mean, I like I like Belfast's chances. I think they're... They've got a lot of offence. You know, we saw that yesterday. Um, and I know that we were very charitable and beneficial towards them. Um, but even having said that, you know, they've got guys that are consistently high point scorers. Um, and they they do look a threat. And I think they'll threaten most teams. I mean, their problem, and, you know, the, the stats speak um, speak about this, but, you know, they've, they've got discipline problems. You know, look, look at the amount of penalty minutes they take. Uh, look at the number of games that you know some of their players have, have sat in the stands for. Um, you know they, they, they might need to just sort of rein that in a little bit if if they're going to have a a tilt at the league title uh, because you know they've certainly got the the offensive weapons to to, to cause teams damage. Um, they just need to you know keep the discipline and if if they keep all their you know, key players on the ice and keep them playing and you know not not sat in the stands serving bands then you know they they've got i think just as good a chance as anybody else at the top of the table to uh, to win the league so yeah and they have got a hell of a lot of home games left and to be able to be in that position where they're at at the moment uh, you know having played so much of their campaign so far on the road to be sat up there where they are with that number of points is is pretty impressive so you know you you've you've got to like your chances if you're a Belfast fan at the moment at the end of the game, the Panthers were roundly booed off the ice by many of those in attendance. There's been an article in the Not- Nottingham Post today from Matt Davis saying he disagrees with the booing. I've seen that elsewhere online. I've also seen elsewhere where people said they deserve to be booed off. I mean, what's your feelings? I mean, Adam, me and you were, were gone by, yep. by the time the final router <laughs> went. Couldn't see it for dust. Yes, we, 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 was off, uh, we was off to get something to help us forget that game <laughs> unfortunately we didn't manage it but uh, what's your thoughts on the booing do you think think it's fair enough or do you think um, it's it's unacceptable at this stage of the season well look you, I mean, you pay your money so you're entitled to your view and people express dissatisfaction in different ways you know some people might boo others might you know choose to leave the the arena really like we did yesterday um so I don't think there's a right and a wrong answer to this. I know it sounds like I'm sitting on the fence, but you know, if you feel passionately about the poor performance the team's put in, then yeah, you boo. But otherwise, you know, it's probably just as effective if the players look around the the, the, the stands at the end of the game and they see you know vast ways of, of blue seats where fans were sat five or ten minutes before. So you know, they, there are different ways to make your your displeasure known, I think. Um, I mean, I've booed before. I didn't boo yesterday because obviously I wasn't physically in the building to boo. But, you know, I've seen really poor performances that have warranted booing because I just felt that that was the best way to get my unhappiness across to the the coaching staff and the players. Um, I haven't done it for a while now. Maybe I'm mellowing with older age. Um, But, you know, those that, do choose to boo 
as long as it's just booing and it's nothing else, you know, and there, there, there's, there's no sort of insults being screamed at individual players or members of the coaching staff, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with that. Um, the only issue is, if, if it's only people, then you can't generally hear the booing. And I don't know how audible it was at the end of the game uh, yesterday, but if Matt's you know, written a piece in the post today about it, then it must have been you know, fairly wide scale and, and quite loud at the, the final buzzer. But, um, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you want to boo, then boo. If you want to walk out and, you know, get as far away from the arena as possible, then that's equally as valid as well. I mean, I, I, I haven't booed. Uh, I have no problem with people booing. It was a dreadful, dreadful performance. And I, I think the players deserve to know how the fans felt at the end of that. It was a Poor, poor performance and mm. I don't think there's anything wrong with the fans expressing their opinion in that way personally I mean Tina what's, what's your thoughts um, I I can understand why there, there was booing um, it, it was it was not a good game to watch um, you know we lost it was the fourth game you know, in a row now that we've lost, we didn't score on the power play. Um, you know, we we've there, there's just a catalogue of things that have just sort of built up, and I think the general feeling of the game as well contributed to it. Is I mean, I, I sat there um, with 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 my gang because uh, I, I was there until the end. Um, so you know, and I sat there, and, and all all four of us, all four of the other three that I sit with, um, we all said, "There's going to be booze." You just knew it was coming. You could just feel it. You, you and I mean, the, I mean, the other thing, I have, I, I have never seen that many people leave before the end of a game. It's like there was a stoppage. I think it was something like five minutes prior to the end, and it, mm. it and and it was like a you know a, a third of the building left, a third of the building walked out, and I've never seen that before. So, you know, I th- I, I don't think that'll have gone unnoticed either. You know, the the guys, you you could see that they were trying. But they were also being outdone by by the other team. But but also, it it did it, it felt like something else was at work. You know, it, it felt like I don't know. It felt like there was a, I don't know fatigue, maybe um, a, a bit of a disharmony, perhaps. I, I don't know. Um, it, it just you, you know you sort of looked around at the faces of of the Panthers team. And and you and to me, I mean, I could have this all wrong, uh, but to me, just, just something's just not quite right. Something's a bit off, and you know, there, there were times where I, I just sort of started to to not directly compare this team to last year's, but I thought, you know, we, we have a team that performed spectacularly in Europe, and now here we are in our domestic campaign with Europe all finished up, and. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it, did did it feel like the focus has gone? Perhaps. I, 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 yeah. I don't know. Well, it was just, no, it, because as I mentioned, I've, I've not been for a couple of weeks, mm. and everything was fine. A year it was over mm. for a month ago, and I know, everything yeah. was, everything was fine. Then we we beat Sheffield, we beat Brayhead, we're at the top of the league. Everything's ticking along nicely. We're playing well, mm. and it's just gone. South very very quickly. I know, yeah. it, and, and this yeah, the, and, and as I say, it, there's just the, the the I don't have the same feeling about the team at the moment, I, I, and I really don't know what's wrong. It just it just seems it's, it just yeah. seems like something's not right, and I just can't yeah. put my finger on it. I, th- I think they're having a crisis of confidence, you know, and you know the booing yesterday. It's probably from those that have seen how good we can perform and have been at games where, you know, we've beat some of the best teams in Europe. And, you know, the team have set a sort of benchmark, haven't they? You know, they've shown what they're capable of doing and what they they can actually produce. And I think when we see the side, you know, a real sort of shadow of its former self, like yesterday... I think the fans are annoyed because the fans know that the players have got better performances in them than that, you know, and, 
and it may well be that you know, I know Nielsen said in in the the match report and in his interview afterwards that he felt the players were trying hard, but the more they tried, the worse things got. And and there could be an element of truth to that because the way that this roster has been assembled, it seems like we have to go out and we have to set the the sort of tempo of the game, and we've got to get a lead because if we go behind in a game, I don't think we can sort of play that that desperate hockey. That, that you need to be able to do to drag yourself back into a match. And, I mean, as soon as we went a couple of goals down yesterday, it was like, well, I just thought the game was finished. There was never any realistic chance that we were going to get back into it. And I think that that's probably, you know, shared by quite a few other fans as well. And And it was hard to watch because we can all still remember some of those great performances not that long ago, you know, in the league and the CHL. And, for us to have gone over a cliff and gone from performing really well to now, you know, struggling to pick up any points during the course of a weekend and playing really badly with it, I think it's quite a lot. Well, it's quite difficult for for a lot of the fans to to sort of stomach because we've got quality players, and I don't think there's anyone doubting that, but they're just not firing at the moment. They look so out of form, it's untrue, and I can't believe how quickly they have fallen out of form. Well, a question that I will put to both of you. So, Tina, I'll come to you first. Is it a blip or a crisis? Um, at the moment, I think you could probably still class it as a blip. But um, if, if we don't turn the corner very, very soon, it's going to develop into a, a crisis. I mean, I know, you know, there'll be fans of other teams that are going, well, you know, you're, you're still in a, a pretty good position. But, you know, the thing is, you know, I'll point you back again to the performances that we've had this season, the progression that we had in the CHL and, you know, the fact that we, we had very high expectations for this team. We still have. Okay. Adam? I think it's, it's just a blip at the moment. If we don't get anything from the next weekend, I think you could probably be justified in calling it a crisis because Belfast and Cardiff are picking up points regularly now. You know, and I know there's going to be ebb and flow over the course of the season and Belfast and Cardiff might hit, you know, a bit of a sticky patch somewhere along the stretch. But I don't like the fact that at the moment we're going backwards and Cardiff and, and Belfast are sort of setting the, the, the terms of, uh, you know, who's going to be at the top of the league come the end of the season. And I worry that if we don't click back into gear and we don't get things firing again on the ice, we're going to get left behind by those two teams. And... You know, are we going to be able to catch up? Um, I, I don't know whether we can or not, because you know, once you're you know five or six points behind teams that are doing well, then you've got an absolutely massive job on your hands to try and you know turn the tanker around and uh, start getting back to performances that we were turning in regularly at the start of the season. So, I think that we've got to get something from this weekend coming up, uh, and then you know the festive. Uh, fixtures that we've got um, you know it's almost getting to the point now where we have to sort of like take full points from a weekend but if we don't then you know it's it's more ground that we're losing on the teams at the top and it's making that sort of job of, of having a strong second half of the season that much more difficult mm. I mean personally I think it's still a blip I've seen what I consider to be a lot of overreactions today from Corey needs to go to all the team needs to go. I mean, come on. It's it's four games now. It's a bit I, I, much. I, yeah, I'm yeah. not I'm not disagreeing that yesterday was awful and it's a it's a bad run and it needs sorting PDQ. However, to to say half the team and the coach should be sacked when we're three points behind top place with a game in hand. I'm sorry, but that's just utterly utterly ridiculous as far as it I'm is. concerned. Totally agree, totally agree. I think that there's been some real knee-jerk reactions. Um, over as the last... there usually is, to be fair. As there usually is, absolutely. Um, but again, you know, we've got guys that are good quality. They don't become bad hockey players overnight. Every professional sportsman and woman probably goes through a bit of a you know, crisis of confidence. You know, if you're in an individual sport, obviously it's more damaging because only you can do something about it. But, but even in a team sport, you know, you only need to have five or six guys on a, you know, roster of 21, 22 players to not be performing. And, you know, that's going to bring the general performance levels down. So I think it might just be a case that everybody is, is 
like fallen out of form simultaneously. Um, you know, you can probably carry one or two guys that aren't playing very well for a, a stretch of time, but it seems like everybody on the roster, well, bar the netminders, uh, you know, have forgotten how to win a game of hockey. So it might just be that we get an ugly win at the weekend and, you know, the confidence comes seeping back into the players and away we go again. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I think, you know, some of the, the overreactions, you know, calling for players to go and coaches to go is is a bit far-fetched. I, th- I think that, you know, Corey obviously knows that it wasn't an acceptable performance and that, you know, the last four games haven't been acceptable to different degrees. But, you know, we have to put our faith in him and we, we, we've got to, you know, expect that he'll be making the players skate that little bit harder in practice this week and, and maybe, you know, doing a bit more shooting practice because you know, the strength of the last few games, the forwards certainly need it. Um, but yeah, we, we, we've got to, we've got to stick at it really and, and, and hope that, you know, we get a win very, very quickly and, and that starts to build the confidence in the guys again. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, calls for players to go, is is you know a bit premature and a bit far fetched. So uh, we, we we've got to stick with these guys because you know they did a sound job for us. I know that loyalty can't last forever, you know. And if if we do continue to drop points and we continue to lose games and, and generally be in bad form, I think those that are you know querying the futures of certain players will will have a little bit more validity. Uh, but I think you know at the moment. Certainly before Christmas, this side of Christmas, we, we, we can't be thinking of getting rid of players. Okay. Before we move on to reveal who is the player of the week this week, uh, some of the comments that you left on your voting forms. Uh, simply not good enough. Saying the team were trying too hard is an insult to every paying fan. Didn't boo, but can understand why so many did. The team has to know that performance was not good enough. Uh, another way, is it time to consider another import forward sniper to take the pressure off the current lines, which look to be having a crisis of confidence in front of the goal? I suppose that's finding someone who's available, and then do you put <laughs> yeah. someone or do you add them to the squad? I mean, that's the other decision <laughs> on that one, isn't it? They don't grow on trees either, do they? <laughs> you certainly uh, don't. Those, those sorts of players, you know, they're, they're very, very highly sought after. And if one becomes available, then, you know, we as the Panthers playing in the Elite League might be some way down the pecking order for where you know, said player might want to go and apply his trade. So uh, I'm sure every team is looking for that elusive sniper that will <laughs> score, you know, 20, 25 goals in the second half of the season. But, you know, sadly, they're, they're not, in, uh, not in great supply. A uh, couple of comments here, and, and they're slightly different, but I think they sort of link. Six goals in the last four games says it all. Just wish the coach was honest and say said how bad they were. Christmas games against Sheffield will be fun to see who is the least rubbish. Now, I disagree, <laughs> with, I disagree with that. We're, we're on a bad run, and, and nobody's denying that. But, you know, to, to call us rubbish after... What, being third in the league in the quarterfinals of the Challenge Cup and three points behind the top, I think that's taking a little bit far, to be honest. But mm. there we go. But the next comment is really disappointing performance when we've seen that this team can be unstoppable when we're at our best. I find it hard to understand how we've gone from such great performances to the complete opposite in such a small amount of space. I would have liked to have seen Tetlow and Kelsall play yesterday, even if it was only in the third. I do agree with that. I, I've I found it very yeah. strange that they rushed back from Dumfries as I did. <laughs> I wasn't dressing. I wasn't dressing for the for the Panthers though. Uh, but but neither of them got a shift. And I think maybe they should have been thrown in there uh, at certain points of the game yesterday. Well, as I understand it, they weren't the only ones. I I I. I, unless somebody wants to correct me, I believe Liam Kirk had exactly the same uh, treatment uh, Col- over at Sheffield. Shudra, yes, and Cole Shudra in Sheffield. Yeah, so well, I mean, so, you know, yeah. you, you've got a couple of you know, no, you know, no, no disrespect to Kelsall and Tetlow because they they did they they were really really good, but uh, but but Cole uh, Cole Shudra and Liam Kirk, I think they were they were two of them that really did shine in the tournament, and so you know you've got two, you know, <laughs> class. GB under twenties, and you don't give them a shift when you know you you're not doing well. Um, and you know it's it, it's a little bit 
I'm, it could just be because I'm a little bit blinkered and I, I, I really I really do root for the kids and I really do root for the underdog and I, I want to see the, the youngsters do well. And, you know, this, this is directed as much at Sheffield as it is at, at the Panthers. If you, if you are having a, a bad game and things are not going right with your, with, with, with your regular players who you give a shift to, you know, on regular settled lines, why not? Why not put them in? What's the worst that could happen? Because, I mean, you know, for, for us, certainly for us, you know, we, we, we'd already let a load of goals in. <laughs> so we'd already shipped a load of goals. So what, what would be the harm? You know, we, we weren't pulling that game back. So, you know, stick them out of there, get them, get them a bit of ice time, a bit of experience. I, I actually, I, I half expected at the very least to see Kelso out on a line with Laco and Betteridge. That, that would not have surprised me at all. But, you know, that, that didn't happen. <clears throat> but yeah, it, it would have been, it would have been good to see the GB players who have, you know, just come back from a tournament with a medal, get a chance to, to, you know, at the very least, you know, bring some enthusiasm to the team because I think, I, I think they could have done with it. Mm. I think the team could have maybe perhaps got a lift because nobody was willing to fight. Nobody on the Belfast team wanted to fight. They were in a great position. They had no reason to. So that was never going to happen. So we weren't going to get uh, an injection of pace or, you know, or, or anything from, from that angle, even though Blessing Gagnon tried. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so why not, why not put the kids out? Because, you know, they, they are enthusiastic and they could, I don't know, what's the worst that could have happened? <laughs> You know, yeah. just give them a go. Mm. Uh, I've got a bit of a long, long one here. It says, I really like Christmas, but it's never perfect because of Panthers' December slump. This weekend was <laughs> abysmal. I was at both games and we have no offensive spark. We've scored six goals in four games and have luckily grabbed a one point in eight because of Garnet making some heroic saves at the end of the third in Manchester. Sunday, Giants were clinical. And they're going to be if the defence was is going to let them have that much chance in front of net and I think that's actually a very very fair point uh, one other comment and it says this team is very capable of winning the league every year for at least five years we have a December slump question is is the capability being coached out of them one dimensional or no response during a game when a back is against the wall now I don't agree with that one either yes we do have a December slump but I don't agree that the coach that capability is being coached out of them we was doing brilliantly up until two weeks ago things don't change like that in two weeks we, we got to the last 16 of the CHL we were top of the league two weeks ago I'm, so, I'm sorry but I cannot agree with that does, does anybody disagree with me no no I think you make some good points um you know, these guys are quality. You know, we've seen that. And I don't think you can coach quality truly out of a player. You know, the lawyers have those abilities. It's just, you know, form and confidence. They're the things that are, you know, impacting on the player's ability to perform well at the moment. And as I said, I think all our players, or, you know, the vast majority of them, have all hit a slump simultaneously. So, yeah, it, it, it's not to me the coaching I mean yeah we can look at things like the, the effectiveness of the power play which has been you know a long standing issue for the Panthers um, you know and we've all got our thoughts about how that might improve but I think to say generally that you know Corey's coaching the talent and the qualities out of these guys is quite you know wide of the mark personally yeah, well, the one, th the only thing I would say, and it's it's maybe just going off onto a little bit of a tangent, is why do we keep having this? You know, we, we've we've almost pretty, you know, with a couple of exceptions, we've got a whole new batch of imports. We've got a couple of, um, yeah, we, I mean, we've got a couple of young guys who have who have never played with us before, and yet we're still talking about having a Christmas slump. You know, if it was the same players year in year out, maybe you could understand it because it'd be in their heads, and, and it would just. It, it would be like an anniversary, you know, an unpleasant anniversary that you don't want to think about. But I, I, I just the, the timing of it is just so unfortunate 
every year and, and I, I just don't I, I just don't understand how it can translate so well <laughs> to, to the new imports I mean surely they if, if nobody talks about it they don't know about it so I, I it's, it's just baffling to me as a fan you know to see it, it happen year, year after year yeah um just another comment. He says, we're lucky we gave ourselves a cushion at the start of the season. That's the only thing keeping us in the title race. However, that being said, with Giants, Road Form and Devils finding our start of the season form, we are probably only three or four, four bad defeats away from really becoming outsiders. Um, I, I, can see, I can see that, to be honest. Um, but one thing that I have noticed this season is how close it is at the top. Everybody seems to be beating each other apart from Edinburgh and Dundee. So I think teams will take points from each other. I wouldn't say three or four bad defeats, probably more like five or six, maybe even I seven. Think, I, I think it depends who the defeats are against. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking, you know... Conference rivals, rights, then, yes. That's co- confer- yeah, definitely conference rivals. But, you know, you, you, you sort of talk... It, you've got those that are nipping at our, at our heels behind us. I mean, Guildford are fourth at the minute. Um, yeah. Well, we've compl- but, we know, completed against Guildford. So, so uh, yeah, six uh, yeah, out of eight points, and they're they're, they're in that's, great that's form at the hands, moment. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think a few more bad defeats, and, and we'll get on to the festive games a little later. But it's going to be a crucial period of of the season coming up. Okay, time to reveal the players of the week, and I don't think it will come as any surprise. But in third place. Is Robert Lakovic second place? Ollie Betteridge and the player of the week for this week. I'm sure you can all guess who it is. It is, of course, Michael Garnett making some outstanding saves over both games in order to keep Panthers in the games. Unfortunately, we only got one point, but that was certainly not down to Michael Garnett in net, who played quite outstanding yesterday against Belfast. Okay, uh, Tina, over to you. Yes, so, uh, Jono, as he has alluded to uh, just uh, a a mere few minutes ago, uh, was away for the week, uh, living the dream, uh, (laughs) quite literally, living a boyhood dream, uh, commentating on the uh, GB Under-20s tournament. Uh, GB uh, finished third behind Korea and Japan after winning three games out of five. Uh, Tetlow and Kelsall, as we've already mentioned, were involved as well as David Clark's son, Morgan. I believe David uh, made his way up there for uh, a couple of games. And uh, for, from what I hear uh, on social media and such, he was a very proud dad and he was uh, feel- feeling the game uh, very much so. He was um, indeed. I, sit- I had a quick... sit- sitting on his hands. <laughs> I had a quick a chat bit. with him uh, after the after the game on uh, on uh, Wednesday night, uh, just before he headed back. So yeah, he, he was incredibly proud of his son, uh, and rightly he should be. Yeah, I, I, just just as a quick mention, that um, that photo um, that we have David Clark stood with uh, Jordan Kelsall and Josh Tetlow, that's going to be the funniest thing to emerge from that uh, mm. tournament as far as I'm concerned because uh, it just serves to demonstrate how how tall Josh <coughs> Tetlow actually is. There's no way you'd lose him in the crowd. Anyway, Jono, tell us all about it. Yeah, it was it was great. Some, some fantastic hockey. So 15 games of hockey there was. Uh, I commentated on all of them. And the thing that that really stood out for me in, in all the games was how quick it was. You know, the the, the speed of, of all the teams, especially Japan and Korea, incredibly fast uh, teams. Great Britain went in as favourites. They were the top seeds. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, pan out that way. They finished third uh, with the bronze medal. Korea were actually the sixth seeds and they finished up with the silver but there's been a lot of investment in ice hockey in Korea with the Winter Olympics coming up and and their uh, senior team getting into the top division of the World Championships so they they were very good if a little undisciplined Japan were excellent and fully fully deserved their, their gold medal for Great Britain they played really really well at the start of the tournament and then a poor performance really against Korea meant that they uh, lost on the pen on penalty shooter, and then Japan were uh, well deserved five two winners on Saturday in a game that that would have decided the gold medal. Had Britain won, 
they would have uh, got the gold medal and promotion. But the standout players, uh, Liam Kirk was outstanding. He finishes the tournament's top scorer at seven plus six, so seven goals, six assists. Uh, Cole Chudra, Chudra was up there as well. Uh, Sam Duggan, who has, of course, had been involved in the senior team, he was the captain. He, he got three goals and four assists. was uh, very, very good, very humble. Uh, I spoke to him after the game against Japan, and he said, look, well, you know, the, the lads give it, gave everything, which they did. And it... Uh, on the day it just wasn't good enough they were beaten by by a better side and, and they accepted that and uh, I had a quick chat with Jordan Kelsall as well and he, he said exactly the same so you know there's, there's a lot to work on uh, but the good thing about this team is a lot of them are young lads they will still have another two one or two tournaments at under 20 level so there'll be some consistency there I mean Liam Kirk is only 17 believe it or not uh, and he was head and shoulders the player of the tournament. Uh, he is a special, special player. And the Steelers are very lucky to have him. And I hope they use him in the right way. Because he is going to be a very, very good player for many, many years. If he continues at the rate of development that he's on at the moment. Uh, but yeah, it was a great week. Um as I say, lived lived a boy of dream, and I hope everyone who watched really, really enjoyed the coverage on, on free sports. And uh, it was great that we was able to get this tournament out on free sports for to a more w- wider audience, and hopefully more tournaments uh, will be shown live on uh, terrestrial television in the very near future. Alrighty. Shall we shall we move on to Elite League results then? Yep, so uh, in the Elite League on Wednesday, the first leg of the Challenge Cup, uh, Dundee taking on Sheffield. Uh, Dundee losing 7-2, so Steelers massive favourites when they go for the second leg. On Saturday, also in the Challenge Cup, it was Five Flyers 3, Belfast Giants 3, so all to play for in that tie. In the league, the Cardiff Devils beat the Sheffield Steelers 4-1. Uh, Brayhead went down at home to the Guildford Flames 5-3 and the MK Lightning gave the Blaze a bit of a stuffing 6-1 in Milton Keynes. On Sunday, the Steelers lost again at home to the Five Flyers 3-1. The Blaze overcame their rather poor result on Saturday night, beating the Storm 7-2. And the Devils, (coughs) with a four-point weekend, beating the Brayhead clan 6-4. The Flames completing a four-point weekend in Scotland with a 7-2 victory over the Edinburgh Capitals. So the things come out of this weekend is the Steelers losing twice. They were also heavily booed off the ice uh, after the game against Fife. Is Paul Thompson under pressure now? He's always under pressure, isn't he? Um, <laughs> Sheffield expects... Um, and losing twice over the weekend is probably, you know, more unacceptable to them than it, it is for us. Um, it's, you know, I, 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 I would imagine things would have to get really, really bad for um, for, for Tomo to get chucked out. Um, but it's not unheard of for the Steelers to make that kind of change. Um, I, I, I suppose... <laughs> They, they they have shown in the past that nobody is irreplaceable. And if if they don't pick it up pretty soon, then, you know, they, they do tend to make moves quite quickly. Uh, I know I know that that's ordinarily with players. Uh, but if, you know, the, the players are coming and going and if the results don't pick up, then, yeah, yeah maybe maybe Tomo does need to uh, make, make some changes um, pretty quickly. Mm. I did notice today that <coughs> Steelers social media seemed to be going on damage limitation. They were retweeting a lot of tweets from fans, of those who said, "Oh, we're behind the team. We're proper supporters. You know, we're right behind Paul Thompson and this team." But from what I've been seeing on social media, the vast majority of Steelers fans are now starting to really turn against Paul Thompson, and I think. Uh, I think he's under he is under a lot of pressure, and I think questions are are being asked, and the the fans up there definitely are very very unhappy. So, you know, 
this Christmas, Boxing Day, and the 27th, I think, has just taken on a whole new meaning uh, with what's happening at both the Panthers and the Steelers at the moment. Uh, the Blaze versus Storm, uh, Blaze winning 7-2, but six DOPS reviews coming from that. Now, four have subsequently been thrown out and uh, no further action will be taken, but two are still being looked at. I mean, what on earth happened there? <laughs> Not sure, <laughs> in a word. <laughs> um, yeah, it seems like quite a wild game uh, at Coventry. Um Bit of a surprising result as well, to be honest, after Manchester beating us the previous night. But, yeah, um, just sounds like uh, lots of players were very edgy and, and angst-ridden. So <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to see what turns up in the wash. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to, to say because the, the highlights only came out just as we went on there and they're not yeah. going to include any of the incidents. So it's not... Really much we can comment on until. Well, they're not worth watching then. If they're not going to put the incidents on, then they're not worth, they're not worth watching. What's the point in putting them out? We might as well wait. <laughs> Uh, the Guildford Flames are up to fourth in the Elite League after a, another four-point weekend. I, I, I feel a bit guilty, actually, because I wrote them off at the start of the season and they've totally and utterly proved me wrong. They, they've uh, been a breath of fresh air and they've really taken to life in the Elite League. They've just been quietly going about their business, haven't they? Um, <clears throat> just, uh, yeah, s- sneaking in, uh, picking up the points there and there. I mean, you know, we've given them three, um, you know, overtime or shootout points, haven't we? So, you know, they 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 won't they're not uh, they're not lying down they're not uh, they they are turning a few heads and they're putting results together uh, the the table does not lie mm. <laughs> does it An- another team who was sneaking up are the five flyers they they've only played 20 games yeah they they're going about their business very quietly i think that they they're, yeah. they're a threat they are they are um you know that I th- they obviously have a few games to play to catch up with everyone else that's around them in the table. But, you know, if they were to win the majority of the games in hand on the rest of the teams above them, I think they'd be knocking on the door of the top four as well. So it's it's good in some ways to see you know, Fife and Guildford mixed it with the uh, the bigger arena teams at the top of the table because, you know, it, it just breaks that sort of monopoly that the arena teams have had over the last well, however many years. And again, you know, there are no massive stars on that five team. Um, you know, a lot of good players, but I think a lot of it's probably due to the team chemistry uh, rather than, you know, any standout individuals. Uh, and, you know, they score their fair share of goals just like Guildford. So um, it just shows you that you know, goals can win your games and goals can you know, do a lot for your league position. So. Uh, yeah, let, let's hope uh, let's hope Panthers start to score a few more goals as well, and uh, and then we can try and get back towards the top of the table. Mm-hmm. Devils top after another four point weekend. I mean, Tina, they are just starting to turn the screw, and like last season, they they're going on a blistering run of form. Well, when you have the consistency of of players, you know, they managed to retain a lot of their players from last season there's familiarity there you know there's the guys know each other they have got into winning ways together they it's it's you know it, it can be habitual and um yeah it, I, I i mean you know I, I think they were my my picks for winning the league and you know they're looking good for it. I, 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 I'll be honest. I don't really think anybody expected anything better. Um, you know, they, 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 sorry, anything. You know, I don't think anybody expected anything less than that. Um, Mid table didn't suit them. <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're picking up results at the right time. And uh, yeah, for, for, from a Panthers perspective as well, they're picking points up at a time when we're not. So we we, we just. It, it, it kind of feels like we're watching them sail off into the distance a little bit at the moment with the, the run of form that they're on. They, I mean, they're not, you know, let, let's points wise, they're still catchable. But I think the, the feeling between our fan base and theirs is, is you know, markedly different. So, mm. yeah, it, I, we, we can, with us only having one uh, league game uh, this weekend as well, um, you know, there's not a lot of 
not a lot of damage we can do uh, in terms of you know the points you know catching up with with both Cardiff and Belfast so but yeah I, 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 I don't think it's much of a surprise quite frankly just before we move on to the festive games, uh, it looks like we're getting a bit of stick on the cage forum from what we've been saying tonight. Uh, some people saying they're a little shocked that they, we don't think five losses in seven games is, is just a blip. Uh, Ginler, of course, has commented, as he always does, saying that we don't like to criticise the Panthers. But I think we've criticised plenty from over the weekend um, during this, we just obviously don't share your ag- agenda again, which is always against the club. We like to be a little bit more balanced than that, but there you go, that's your opinion, and we respect you for it. So, we move on to the festive games. Uh, Friday, the 22nd of December, Milton Keynes away in the Challenge Cup. Um, Wednesday, the 2nd of January, Milton Keynes at home in the Challenge Cup. Sandwiched between them are five Elite League games, and this is where it gets really important. I suppose everything depends on these five League games. 23rd of December, this Saturday, Manchester at home. This Christmas doubleheader against the Sheffield Steelers. Steelers away on Boxing Day and at home on the 27th of December. And then a doubleheader with Coventry, 30th of December at home <coughs> and New Year's Day away at the Sky Day. It's a pretty packed schedule. And looking at that, it's seven games in what eleven days. It's a, it's a, it's, you know, all resolves of fitness have got to uh, come into that. I mean, Adam, we, we'll not mm. go into individual games, but what do you make no. of that schedule, and what do you think we can uh, get out of it? Well, I think most teams will probably have a similar number of games that they need to you know, play over the festive period, or certainly those that are involved in the Challenge Cup. Um, it's difficult. We just need to get off to a good start, don't we? If we if we manage to to get a win away at Milton Keynes on Friday, then hopefully you know we use that as a bit of a positive to to take into the following game. And then again, you know Manchester at home is a winnable game. We, we've got to be winning those sorts of games if we're going to be you know challenging at the top end of the table. So you know that'd be nice if if we got into those two games and we took wins away from them. Sets us up nicely for the the home and away series against the Steelers over Christmas. Um, they're going to be very, very interesting games. I think that, um, well, both teams are obviously bang out of form at the moment, so it will be interesting to see which teams turn up for those fixtures. But, you know, both sides will probably fancy the chances. You know, they'll think that they can get four points and, and we ought to be thinking we can get four points out of it as well. And then against Coventry, well, you know, Coventry not pulling any trees up this season. I know they got a good result against the Storm yesterday, but uh, I think that's a bit of an anomaly because they're, they're not having a particularly great season. So again, if we want to be serious contenders in the league, we've got to be beating Coventry home and away. Uh, and then, yeah, the very last game, Milton Keynes home. Well, let's just hope that the score line's, you know, quite advantageous to us by that point, which means that we... Uh, we don't have a you know a mountain to climb to to overcome a deficit and qualify for the next round of the cup. Yep. Tina, how do you do you see this uh, festive period of games? Um, I well, if I've sort of run from top to bottom, as it were, the Challenge Cup fixture. I think I, I don't. I, I I think we might come away with a deficit from that because you know there are chinks in the armour of Milton Keynes home form and um, we did put the first uh, you know the, the the first wound in that <clears throat> but um the, you know you, you still you still can't you can't discount them at home definitely not yeah I, their, their record still favors them so i i suspect we may come away with a deficit if we don't i'm wrong i'm obviously i'm going to be delirious uh, but at the same oh, well I, I will jump to the other one actually just to just to finish the challenge cup ones off but i i think we'll i think we will do the business at home if the deficit is not too large because Milkins, uh, as, as strong as they are at home, they are still pretty rubbish away from home. So I, th- I think that's an opportunity that we we definitely need to pounce on. You know, I've, I've, I've said, I said it at the time. I'll say it again, and I apologise if I'm offending anybody at Milton Keynes, but that was a commercial decision uh, picking us for the uh, for the Challenge Cup. Um, you know, great. And, I hope then, get t- and then taking the, the the first leg at home when 
they yes. had the right to take the second leg at home. Yes, exactly. So uh, I hope you get what you what you uh, want out of that, Milton Keynes. But by God, I hope we take what we want out of it. Um, so you know, that's that's how I see the Challenge Cup going. Um, the, the um, I think I, I, with with how we are at the moment, form wise. Unless we turn a corner, we they're all they're all games that we we could lose. I think the most precarious one, uh, because of how I feel about games down there, I think the most precarious one is the Coventry away one, uh, because we don't do well in the Sky Dome. End of. There's there's just no two ways about that. We don't do well in the Sky Dome. So that that one I I feel is the most precarious one. Um, Manchester at home. I would like to think we can we can we can take the points for, from our building we, you know they we they we took a point from theirs i would i would like to see us take two uh, in the in in that fixture on uh, on saturday yeah steelers away steelers home that's going to be it, it's going to be interesting it it it's it, it's going to be interesting to see who who can turn the corner first who is you know which which coach can motivate their team better for those games i mean the the games speak for themselves they they sell themselves both arenas normally have a sell out so you know the crowds should be up for it I, I i really hope they are and yeah coventry at home i i would expect us to to deal with that because like adam says they're not they're not making great waves at the moment so we should we should be able to and we should be aiming to pounce on opportunities like that okay and just a quick question i ask you before we finish would you sacrifice progress in the challenge cup for victories in the five league games yes yes i would as well okay fair enough I, I'm. I wonder. I, I, I might throw that open to to all the listeners and, and just let us know what you think about that because I think that the that'll be quite mixed. Uh, obviously, I want to win all seven, but I think <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> yeah, but I think for for ten league points, I, yeah. I think I would sacrifice those that that challenge cup for ten league. If we co- if we come out if we come out of those games, and and we've taken points from every single game. I'll give up chocolate for January. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> and we will hold her to it. Don't, don't, you can guarantee it. Uh, what about vanilla vodka? Uh, to, seriously, behave yourself. <laughs> uh, I'd have to be a lot more confident than that. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. OK, we will leave it there. This will be is the last show before Christmas and the last show uh, of 2017 as far as the review podcast goes. We've obviously still got STCW to come on Wednesday, which will be our last podcast of the year. Just thank you to everyone who's listened throughout 2017. We're obviously more to come in 2018 and we will hopefully have some spot podcasts uh, from various venues uh, after games throughout the festive period however it is Ask TCW on Wednesday if you've got a question for us you would like us to discuss I'm sure there's plenty for you to think about and want to want, would like us to discuss as well you can do easiest ways via Twitter at Cast Whiskers TV leave your question there use the hashtag Ask TCW you've got the various fan groups on Facebook as well as the TCW Facebook page email is TCW online TV at gmail dot com and then we have a dedicated thread thread on the cage forum which i referred to a little earlier um so that is it for the review podcast for this year also big thank you to the bunkers the lint uh, our sponsors for continuing to support us as they have done brilliantly throughout this year and uh, all that's left is to say thank you very much to adam reddish thanks everybody thanks for listening and to tina taylor DTFM. And as, although they're not here, many thanks also to Aunt Andy, Paul and Aaron, uh, who are obviously not here tonight. So that is it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I uh, hope you enjoy a wonderful Christmas and New Year. We're back on Wednesday with STCW. But until then, thanks for listening and bye-bye.
This edition of the Cat's Whiskers podcast was brought to you by the Bunkers Hill Hockley.